This is the lecture for um, lesson number seven, um, John chapter five. Let's pray. Lord God most high, uh, we come now before you uh, seeking your leadership, your leading us into a um, clearer understanding of your son Jesus Christ, uh, seeing him as he truly is. Heavenly Father, we pray that um, your Holy Spirit would open up our eyes to see him as having all authority over uh, heaven and earth, just as he has claimed here in this chapter. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, in 2018, um, the newspaper USA Today conducted a survey. They uh, asked respondents if they could ask God one question, what would they ask? Well, the top responses were ones that we've all heard, we've talked about before. What is my purpose here on earth? Will I have life after death? Why do bad things happen? Is there intelligent life elsewhere? Uh, we are curious people and we like to ask questions. We like to think we want to learn more about ourselves and about the world we live in. And so we ask questions. But I submit to you that we would learn far more about ourselves if we were not asking the questions. Rather, Jesus was, at, was asking us questions. Have you ever noticed that Jesus liked to ask questions when you read the Gospels? Some ambitious soul actually went and counted all of Jesus' questions in the Bible. 339 total what I understand. But Jesus doesn't ask questions to gain knowledge like, like we do. Uh, knowing our hearts, he already knows the answers. Jesus asks questions to get us thinking, to get us talking, to carry on conversations that are going to lead us somewhere important. Tonight, Jesus has a few questions for us. He's going to pose one to an invalid there in John chapter 5. But the question is really for us. And that question, do you want to get well, it seems like a silly one. And yet it is quite searching. The answer isn't so obvious. Jesus' questions are designed to make us truly consider our desires and our priorities. They are designed to make us come to terms with who he is and how uh, we have responded to him. My intent this, this week is that each one of us will come to know that Jesus is equal to God the Father. He's not a mere representative for God. He is God and he has the authority to judge and give eternal life. My outline is, again, three parts. First, we're going to see Jesus heals an invalid on the Sabbath, the first 15 verses. And the question that he posed, do you want to get well? And we should, should pose that question for ourselves. Do we want to get well spiritually? And then Jesus defends his authority and deity, verses 16 to 30. Now, Jesus didn't ask a question here in these verses here, but kind of in keeping with the theme of it, we, we could easily pose one, couldn't we? Do you and do I know the real God. Think about it. When God's actions offend us, who is in the right and who is in the wrong? And then Jesus' confirming witnesses actually condemn the unbelieving Jews, verses 31 to 47. Again, the question we, would, we need to ask ourselves is, do, do we believe the witnesses? Whether we believe or not says a lot about the conditions of our hearts and what our priorities are. So, if you would open up our, your Bibles to John chapter 5. <clears throat> you know, it's only, think about it, it's only in John's Gospel that we know that Jesus' ministry lasted for three years. Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, only record Jesus' one trip to Jerusalem. It was his last trip when he was crucified. But John records multiple feasts that Jesus traveled to Jerusalem. 
Now, there were three feasts each year that Jewish males were required to attend, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 1, it begins, Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Jews. Now, how much time had elapsed in which feast? We're not exactly sure. John refers three times to, John, to Jesus attending the Passover and once for the Feast of Tabernacles. So this feast may have been Pentecost. And Pentecost was celebrated 50 days after Passover. So sometime later may have been a month and a half or so. Now, while in Jerusalem, Jesus, on this particular trip, Jesus went to the pool of Bethsaida, Bethesda, excuse me. Uh, and we have a map for you of this, and it actually shows this pool. It was located just north of the temple near the Sheep Gate. Now, for years, critics challenged John's gospel on this passage, but archaeological uh, excavations actually uncovered two pools near the Sheep Gate with five colonnades. Uh, their finding confirmed the accuracy of John's description. Now, as near as this, this pool was to the temple, in a sense, it was worlds away. The temple was magnificent. It was clean. It was this bright white marble with gold inlay. It sparkled in the sun. But the pool of Bethesda was probably dirty and smelly. It was populated with people of little hope. Verse 3 says there was a great number of disabled people there who used to lie near the pool. And if you look close at the passage, you'll see that the latter half of verse 3 and verse 4 have been omitted in most of our Bibles. These verses uh, do not appear in the oldest and, and best manuscripts. And so they were probably added later to explain the situation. These pools have, uh, had been associated with Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And over the years, syncretism uh, had led to the traditions of Greek paganism blending with Judaism. This tradition held that the pool was stirred occasionally by an angel, and the first person to enter the pool after that stirring would be healed of their infirmity. It was into this pitiful place that Jesus went. There was a multitude of disabled people, but Jesus singled out one man, an invalid, a man crippled for 38 years. Apparently, he had lost the use of his legs, his situation hopeless. And in an act of sovereign grace, Jesus asked him a question, a question we might think odd given his situation. Do you want to get well? The question was intended to focus the man's attention on Jesus himself and to raise his hopes. Knowing the man's heart, Jesus' question established Jesus' claim. And he backed it up in verse 8 with a command, get up pick up your mat and walk. And the man did. I find this to be one of the most remarkable signs yet. Legs that had atrophied over the decades were instantly made strong. Even with the strength reestablished, he, he, he would have had to learn to stand and to balance all over again. And yet, uh, uh, I think the man jumped up uh, uh, quickly. He, he, he was an example of Isaiah's prophecy concerning the Messiah, that the lame would leap like deer. But there was a problem with this healing. It took place on the Sabbath. The Mosaic law forbade work on the seventh day of the week. And throughout Israel's history, the nation had struggled with the Sabbath laws. They had violated it over and over again. When Judah was ultimately expelled from the land, taken into exile in Babylon, it was primarily for two reasons, idolatry and Sabbath violations. Now, after the exile was over and the people returned, they worked hard to eliminate these sins. But for the Sabbath, the problem was defining what was work 
and what was not. So the religious leaders developed 39 categories of rules for the Sabbath. These man-made rules changed the Sabbath from its intended blessing into a burden. And guess what was covered under number 39? It was carrying your mat on the Sabbath. And so instead of being celebrated and marveled at, this healed man found himself in trouble. Realizing his dilemma, he shifted the blame. He said he was only following orders. And since the man did not know Jesus' name, it appears this sign was the first sign that did not, at least initially, result in any faith. Jesus acted strictly out of grace, choosing this man because of his need and Jesus' desire to display God's glory. Bethesda, the name of the pool, means house of grace or house of mercy. It was an appropriate name for the location of this third sign and quite the contrast to the attitude of the Jews who confronted the man. In verse 14, Jesus later sought the man out at the temple and he warned him. He said, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, there's no evidence that the man's disability was due to a specific sin. But as awful as his previous 38 years had been, hell would be far, far worse. His legs were restored. The man's soul still needed healing. Jesus not only wants to heal our physical affirmities, this particular sign uh, points to the spiritual healing that he can provide us. He can heal our souls. And the principle for these verses is that only Jesus can bring hope to our hopeless situations. This story is an illustration of man's spiritual state. The invalid man was helpless to improve his condition. He had no one to help him into the pool. We are helpless to extract ourselves from our sinful state. When Jesus went, into the, uh, went to the pool of Bethesda, he saw a great crowd of people there. He saw the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, all unable to affect their situations. All were blind to the Son of God who had come into their midst. But in his grace, Jesus picked that man out of the many. There was nothing in that man to commend him to God. And there's nothing in you and me to commend us to God. It's only his sovereign pleasure, uh, only for his sovereign pleasure that he reconciles some to himself. Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? And he asks us the same question. Do you, do I want to get well? If we look at our lives and we look at the way we live, the answer isn't always obvious. Jesus can help us beyond our wildest expectations if we turn to him for help. The way Jesus healed the invalid man is the same way he heals us spiritually. This third sign is a, a beautiful uh, example of redemption. It happened immediately. It was complete and it was transforming. Since Jesus Christ is God, he has the power to transform lives. We must want to get well, though. And when we do want to be healed of our sins, he will amaze us with the power to transform our lives. Now, we wonder what is worse than violating the Sabbath? Well, certainly commanding others to violate the Sabbath would be, would, would, would be in that category. Jesus had not only told the man to take his mat and walk, but he had apparently healed other people as well. So the Jews persecuted him. We don't know how this confrontation came about, but they must have challenged him on this count. Having broken the Jews' Sabbath regulations was bad enough, but now Jesus' defense was really going to make their blood boil. In verse 17, he says, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. The Jewish rabbis 
knew that God did not rest after completing his creation on the sixth day. Anyone could see it, that, that babies were born and people lived and died on the Sabbath. The sun would rise uh, on the Sabbath. The rains would replenish the land. You could just look around you and see that God was creating new life and providing for all his creation. These were clear signs of God at work. Now, since God was working, it was not wrong for his son to do acts of grace and mercy. This was a clear statement by Jesus, and the Jews immediately picked up on his claim to be God. John says they tried all the more to kill him. Jesus' defense was that since he is God and does what the Father does, he was not in violation of the Sabbath. Jesus' work on the Sabbath was enough for, the men to, for men to hate him. His claim to be God, they could not accept. They would not accept. And uh, we, we'll see why at the, at the end of the chapter. In verse 19, Jesus described his ministry, and he makes a series of claims of equality with God. First of all, as a nation, the Israelites thought of God as their father. But as individuals, they would never think of calling him father. That was unheard of, and yet Jesus did. As the son of God, Jesus did not act independently from his father. He said that he followed his father's lead. In verse 19, Jesus says, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Now, Jesus was capable of independence. In fact, if you think about it, much of Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness was uh, about trying to get him to use his divine powers to act as he wanted, not as the father wanted. But what Jesus means here is that he chose not to act independently. He chose to willingly take a subordinate role. And at the root of this subordination is love. In verse 20, the father loves the son. He demonstrates his love by revealing everything he does to his, everything he does to his son. Uh, that this would be Jesus' second claim to equality. He knows what the Father knows. And then the Son also loves the Father. He demonstrates his love for the Father through perfect obedience. He does whatever the Father directs him to do, and he will continue to do so all the way through the cross. Because everything Jesus says and does came to him from the Father, he reveals to us the Father's nature and character. He reveals the Father to us not because he loves us, even, even though he does. He, he does so because he loves his Father. Now, if some were amazed at Jesus' healing of the invalid, they'd be far more amazed of, at, at his later works. The Father has given him the authority to grant life. Uh, the, that's the third claim of equality with God. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus saw his father granting life on the Sabbath. In the same way, Jesus would give eternal life to those that he sovereignly chose. In fact, in verse 26, he says that the father has granted the son to have life in himself. Again, another claim of equality. Jesus is not some ambassador acting for God. He is God and is the source of life, eternal life. Now, the fourth claim of equality is judgment. In this case, the Father chooses not to judge. He, rather, he has entrusted all judgment to Jesus. And we wonder, why would he do this? Well, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Since he is both, he's uniquely qualified to judge. You know, in Revelation 5, we'll, we're going to study that next year, Jesus is the only one worthy of opening up the scroll. He alone is worthy to judge the world because the Father would judge him for all of the sins of the world. For these reasons, the Father is given all authority to judge to his Son. But even in judgment, Jesus does not judge on his own. He judges in accordance with 
with what he has heard from the Father. And then in verse 29, you might think that Jesus' judgment is based on works because it reads, those who have done good will rise to live and those uh, who have, uh, those who have uh, done evil will rise to be condemned. Uh, that's, while it sounds like it's works-based, that's not true. Those who have done good are those who have come into the light of Christ. We saw that back in chapter 3. Those who have done evil are those who have rejected him. And that leads me to the next principle. And that is that Jesus Christ has the authority to judge and grant eternal life. Jesus was not a Sabbath violator if he was God. That was his claim. He did, he did what he saw his father doing. God the Son did not act independently of God the Father. The very essence of their relationship was love, is love. Jesus is not some agent acting on behalf of God. He is God and has all author the authority of God. Now, we had that question in our lesson. Why is it important to believe that Jesus is God's Son, equal to the Father in power and authority? Well, it is important to believe he is God because that's his claim. To see Jesus as anything less is to call him and his Father liars. This is serious enough, but we must also believe that Jesus' uh, Jesus's claim to have eternal life. Only Jesus, as a perfect man, could live a sinless life and be an acceptable sin sacrifice. Only Jesus, as infinite God, could pay the price for an infinite number of sins for an infinite number of people. So the question I ask, who do you perceive Jesus to be? If he is anything less than who he claims to be, you and I are lost in our sins. If he has the authority to judge all people and grant life or death, then he is worthy of our worship. Now, the theme of witnesses and testimonies has, uh, is a recurring one in John's writings. Jesus moved from describing his ministry to the evidence behind him. Jesus began... Uh, not by testifying by, uh, on his own behalf. He, he could have, because he was God. His testimony would have been valid. But Jesus knew that the Jews would never accept it. In addition, Jewish law required two or more witnesses to establish facts. So Jesus gave them more than enough witnesses. Four, in fact. The first witness we see in verses 33 to 35. It's John the Baptist. His function was to be a witness. Jesus didn't need human witnesses, but John's role was an important one. He prepared the nation by pointing them to the light. The people received John for a while. His preaching had stirred the nation, even though he had sternly rebuked them. Many thought that they were on the verge of the Messiah coming, and they were, but his was not a deliverance that they were looking for. Eventually, John's lamp burned out. He was never accepted by the authorities, and even his popularity amongst the people began to wane. Now, the second witness is found in verse 36, and, and that is the miracles that Jesus performed. They should have been more effective than John. Jesus' supernatural works were works a sign by God for him to do. They were signs that were foretold in the Old Testament. In chapter 3, we saw that Nicodemus recognized their testimony. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. But the majority of religious leaders did not accept the, uh, this testimony. They should have been joyous for the healed invalid, but instead they were judgmental for his violation of the Sabbath laws. The third witness is found in verse 37. It's, it's God the Father. 
Now, exactly what Jesus meant by uh, his father as a witness, I'm not sure. He could have meant God's pleasure voice during his baptism, or po quite possibly the Holy Spirit's moving in the hearts and minds of people as they heard Jesus. You know, the Old Testament prophets, they heard God's voice when he spoke to them. And Moses, he even saw God's form on Mount Sinai. But these Jewish leaders were totally ignorant of God. They did not know his voice or recognize him when he came in their midst. And the reason why is found in verse 38. God's word did not dwell in their hearts. This was proven out when they did not recognize Jesus as the Christ. And then the fourth witness is verse 39. Uh, that's the scriptures. The religious leaders studied the Old Testament scriptures with great diligence. They believed if only they could understand the text, they would gain heaven. Now, this is an easy trap for us today. We, we, we can start thinking that, Bibles, that Bible study is the end all. It is not. It is an opportunity to lead, to learn more about God and to grow in our love for him. But these Jewish leaders missed the point from the scriptures. They were to teach the people about the promised Christ so that when he arrived, they would recognize him. But in verse 40, Jesus said the religious leaders refused to come to him for life. They simply chose not to receive him. The Jews may have thought that Jesus was angry because uh, the, the, the religious establishment had not endorsed him. In verses 41 through 44, Jesus said that was not true. He knew their hearts, and they did not have the love of God in them. They had accused him of breaking the Sabbath command. But in fact, they were the ones who had broken the law. Uh, they had broken the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. He knew their hearts, and they were more disposed to accept a false prophet than the real Son of God. They preferred acceptance for men rather than God's approval. And in verse 44, Jesus said, How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the one and only God? The answer is they couldn't, and we can't. You see, true faith is impossible in a heart that values man's approval over God's. Jesus described his authority to judge mankind. That was not his purpose during this incarnation. His purpose was initially to be our Savior. He did not need to accuse the Jews because Moses would do that for him. The Jews claimed to be disciples of Moses, but they had broken the very covenant that he had set up. They had missed the person that Moses had written about in the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Old Testament. And since Moses' writings were rejected, Jesus' words would also be rejected. And that leads me to the final principle. And that is that there is, a, there is convincing evidence that Jesus is God. The witnesses that Jesus listed are basically the same ones that we have today. Now, we don't have John the Baptist, but there are others present to point us to Christ. We don't get to see the physical miracles, but, but if you think about it, they were not very compelling to the majority, even in Jesus' day. We do have God in the person of the Holy Spirit who convicts our hearts. We do have the complete canon of scriptures, Old Testament and New, and they clearly point to Jesus. And we do have wonderful Bible scholars and our own pastors who help us to understand the scriptures. They help guide us in our faith. And so the obvious question is, where do you and where do I stand on these testimonials? If you are more interested in your place in society, than in your place in God's family, I'll never believe. If you care more about what others think of you than what God does, you will never believe. See, such hearts are sterile ground for faith. 
But if you are honestly seeking, then the evidence will be sufficient to bring you to a reasoned faith that Jesus Christ is the Almighty God and He is sovereign over all creation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this um, great teaching that Jesus provided concerning his, his authority and his power, his deity. Heavenly Father, I pray that um, your spirit would um, dwell in our hearts and uh, help us to embrace these truths, apply them to our lives, and, and that, such that we would truly trust in Jesus and in his power and authority, um, not just over all creation, but in our lives specifically. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.